to MB2 or not to MB2? That is the question. Recently, I ran into an internet comment that read, The MB2 myth. I have rarely found and obturated an MB2 on upper first molars. Out of literally hundreds and perhaps thousands of such teeth, I have seen only a handful and yet have had near 100% success with such procedures. I really enjoy doing upper first molars because of the relative ease of access and straightforward simplicity. I just don't buy that 90% of all upper first molars have an entire extra canal that I have been missing for 15 years. Prove me wrong and I'll look harder. Signed, Dr. Dave. Well, Dr. Dave, what you're saying is like a gastroenterologist saying that there's no such thing as an appendix and that the myth of the appendicitis is a complete hoax. Interestingly, much like the appendix, the MB2 comes in various sizes and configurations. But unlike the appendix, the true incidence of MB2 can easily be verified firsthand by sectioning a bunch of extracted first molars in vitro. So just section the root in an axial sections and then see for yourself under the high magnification. Otherwise, others have already done this study numerous times and have found that the MB2 is there anywhere from 60 to about 95% of the time histologically based on a few different studies around the world. Now, these rates differ slightly from 60 to 90% as the rate of MB2 varies in different ethnic populations. Nevertheless, this annoying little canal is there the vast majority of the time, histologically, and this is just a little scientific fact and is really not a matter of controversy. Now, a more valid argument is what percentage of cases where the MB2 is present can be accessed clinically, and then what percentage, if not found, can lead to endodontic failure, and that's really valid. Well, according to uh, the Coolidge study, the MB2 is present 92% of the time histologically. And another study by Alchem found that the, with the aid of the microscope and illumination and the piezoelectric ultrasonics, they managed to get access to about 75% of them, which is really significantly higher than using conventional techniques without a microscope. Uh, such as just using the naked eye. Now, I personally feel that I have a similar rate of finding and treating the MB2 clinically, which is at about 80% of the time. And in fact, when I don't find the MB2 in a maxillary first molar, I'm worried and require further investigation. It's best to look for the MB2 at about two millimeter in a distal lingual direction from the MB1, and it's best not to go really deeper than two millimeters if you can't find it in, to reduce the risk of causing problems in terms of thinning out the furcal floor uh, or perforating from the sides. Now, don't forget that you have to remove the shelf of the dental triangle as the MB2 is oftentimes hidden under it uh, as interproximal decay can cause uh, secondary dentin formation or reparative dentin that could potentially cover the MB2 in those areas. Now, we are lucky to have CBCTs available to us at, this, at the present time, and you can increase your odds of knowing whether an MB2 is likely present or not before you even access the tooth by examining a CBCT or taking a CBCT mid-operatively to confirm that it's not there in case you have a conical canal. But due to the limited resolution of this type of a radiography, uh, we still are estimating rather than knowing for sure in all of our cases. Therefore, it is really best to assume this following rule that the MB2 is always there until proven otherwise. So all maxillary first molars have four canals and most or many of the maxillary second molars also have four canals. So I think that understanding the dentinal map on the furcal floor and then searching for the MB2 where you need to look for while considering the boundaries of the tooth and not weakening it or causing a potential perforation is really uh, an art that each person really should master on their own. Now, many of the MB2s when present have a wine type two classification, which is that they really, um, they join somewhere around the apical area and they don't have a separate exit, which is the reason why missed MB2s don't often fail immediately. 
these cases may fail several years down the line uh, as it takes a while for the leakage to reach the apex. And therefore, we should do our best to identify and then get down these canals whenever possible. In fact, the vast majority of the time, when I see a maxillary molar um, in a radiograph where there's been a history of endodontic treatment and then there's an isolated lesion around the mesobuccal root, even though the root canal may have reached full length, I'm willing to bet in those cases that it's because of a missed MB2. Now, we know that apicoectomy is not a good option in these kinds of cases because placing an apical plug in an untreated root will always have a poor long-term prognosis. And in the past, many people have described the need for total disassembly and then retreatment of these kinds of cases. While disassembly is often necessary due to problems associated with uh, other roots, in cases where the lesion is merely limited to the mesiobuccal root and a coronal restoration of good quality is present or there's a post present, I've described a technique that is more minimally invasive and that spares the crown and saves the uh, patient several appointments and is also economically more feasible for the patient because they, obviously they don't have to replace the crown. So if used in the right indications and the right patient, it will work very well. Now, let's take a look at a clinical case to show you this technique and demonstrate what I'm talking about clinically. Okay, folks, let's take a look at this maxillary first mole that was referred to my office for peripical surgery. And whenever I see a lesion that's confined to the mesiobuccal root of a molar and the rest of the roots are uh, not showing any lesions or infection, it's pretty much a sure bet that it's a missed MB2 or maybe an isthmus. Here, an apicoectomy is not a good indication for a tooth like this, and so we decided to use a technique that uh, I use quite often that helps address these teeth non-surgically find the MB2 and uh, not have to redo the crown, preserves the crown by having a very small and uh, a very conservative axis opening directly over the mesiobuccal root. So here, as you can see, the first thing you would do is you would make a small axis opening directly over the mesiobuccal root, and the goal is to find the treated root. From that gutta percha on the MB1, you can then uh, use it as reference to find where the MB2 would normally be. So you follow the dental map and the external and internal landmark, and you can see here that in a stiff number six hand file here uh, was uh, f uh, able to find the MB2, and a radiograph confirms that the MB2 is found, and it is a separate exit indeed, which explains the reason why there is a peripical lesion. So further exploration finds an MB3 as well in this tooth. So we got an MB1, MB2, and MB3. And following instrumentation using ESX files to a size 35 in each canal and full irrigation protocol, I'm now using just the macro cannula here to dry the disinfectant. And you can see that when I dry the MB3, all the fluid in MB2 is dried as well, which indicates that MB2 and MB3 are joining each other in almost like a Frank Wine class two uh, canal morphology. So now I'm using the BC sealer, by ceramic sealer, for the bonded obturation technique, uh, and I'm injecting using advanced technique a little bit of the sealer just in the coronal half of the root. And you can see that when I inject the sealer in the MB2, I'm having some uh, back filling of uh, the sealer coming in into the MB3. And when I place it in the MB3, it back flows up on the MB2, again, further indicating that these uh, two canals, MB2 and MB3, are actually joining each other. And they're not three separate exits. But we know that they're two separate exits. And we've already found that's the cause of the patient's uh, chief complaint and the infection. So we uh, proceed to fit our fitted BC cones that are biceramic coated, uh, got approach cones. And uh, this 35 is seated all the way to the full working length. So I put one in the MB1 to the full working length and one into the MB3 to the full working length. And the middle one, which is MB2, I'm expecting it not to go to the full working length. And indeed, it doesn't. And I was expecting that since I knew that they were joining in the uh, apical third of the root. So... I'm, uh, this kind of fits the picture uh, that I'm expecting, and a radiograph is exposed to kind of confirm that, and you can see that they're seated, and the trial fill shows that they're on two-fold length. Now, the best way, because of the restricted axis in this tooth, instead of trying to go all the way down using the Endo Pro 270 at the orifice level and sear these gutta-percha cones off at that level, 
which bears the risk of you pulling out the entire, uh, all the cones, I'm removing the cones one layer at a time, first at the cave of surface and then working my way down to the orifice level. Once I'm down at the orifice level now, I'll proceed to do my condensation right at the orifice level. And then, as usual, removing the uh, excess sealer uh, using ultrasonics and water. And then after that's done, I take a condenser and further uh, condense the molten gutta percha right at the level of the margins uh, to uh, have a be better adaptation right uh, to the dentin. And here now, just cleaning and drying. And you can see now a little bit at a lower magnification that the three orifices are filled with uh, gutta percha in this hydraulic condensation technique. You can see the axis preparation is fairly conservative and small. We managed to preserve the crown so this patient doesn't have to go and get a new crown. And the three separate orifices are shown here. Now what I do, I place a bonded layer of a, of an endosequence liner here on the floor of the chamber. And the reason I do that is so that I can have immediate uh, seal over the material, over this material. But the reason I don't fill it all the way up to the top is because I, this, you know, because the top material has to be a bond, is a different kind of bond. You can't just use a bonding agent. You really need to use silane. I, I refer that back to my re restorative dentist who is going to remove the little cavity that I have him put in there and put silane and do a proper bonding. So this shows a preoperative radiograph with the lesion. This is the uh, fitting of uh, finding the canal and getting all the way down. This is just a different straight on angle that shows that the preparation is actually fairly conservative and it's not uh, expansive. And here's the final radiograph that shows that these three canals uh, were obturated all the way down to the apex and the patient's chief complaint uh, was resolved and all the symptoms uh, went away. And this is a way of uh, treating these cases very conservatively without removing the crown and addresses only what is the problem. In conclusion, the MB2 is present the majority of the time. This little canal is a histological fact and not really taking it seriously will result into long-term failure of your cases. Now, while some cases become problematic immediately, uh, postoperatively, uh, with persistent symptoms, many of these cases where a, 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 an MB2 has been missed may become a problem several years down the line. It's a critical thing that we use magnification and illumination and be aware of the pulpal morphology and the furcal dentinal map when treating these uh, types of maxillary molars, whether the first or the second. Experience is needed in these cases, and it can best be obtained by doing lots of access preparation in extracted teeth and then sectioning them afterwards. Looking at several dozen teeth this way can help you become more familiar with this anatomical aberration that's problematic for both the patient and the clinicians. So to our friend Dr. Dave, please look harder. For Vivo Bendo, this is Ali Nese, and I hope you found this information helpful. Thank you.